Bonnie Woodward was a 47-year-old woman from Alton in Illinois. She was a two-time cancer survivor and she worked as a caretaker at the Eunice Smith Nursing Home. Bonnie had four children, but only three was living with her. Her 17-year-old daughter Heather was living with another family because she had an argument with Bonnie. The family she was living with is Roger Carroll, his wife Monica, and their 16-year-old son, Nathan Carroll. She knew them through church. Bonnie was last seen on the 25th of June 2010 at work. Her co-workers saw her talking to an unknown man. The next day, she did not show up for work. Her co-workers and her boyfriend got worried, since it was so unlike her, and she was reported missing. The first thing they looked into was the unknown man Bonnie was seen talking to. They noticed that he resembled Roger Carroll a lot, the man Bonnie's daughter was living with. The police also found his fingerprints on her car. When questioned, Roger told police that he wasn't even in the area on the day she disappeared. Police had no physical evidence that he was involved and had to let him go. There was absolutely no other leads and the case grew cold. That was until March 2020. Nathan Carroll, now 25 years old, wanted to tell police what really happened to Bonnie. He told them that he kept his father's secret for 10 years, but recently his father Roger had begun abusing his mother Monica and he had enough. Nathan testified against his father. This is everything he had to say about what really happened. On the day that Bonnie was last seen, June 25, 2010, Roger and Nathan returned early from verification, leaving behind Monica and Heather at Nathan's grandmother's house. Roger drove past the Eunice Smith nursing home and saw Bonnie's car. He then said to Nathan, Good, she's working today. Later in the afternoon, Nathan heard 8 or 9 gunshots in the backyard of their house and he went to check. He saw his father with a handgun and Bonnie laying on the ground wearing scrub pants and white sneakers. Roger then ordered Nathan to start a fire. Roger picked up Bonnie with a front loader and dropped her in the fire pit. The two of them kept the fire going for days till there was only charred bone fragments left. Roger also instructed Nathan to destroy her phone with a hammer and mow over the grass where the fire was. Nathan complied because Roger told him Bonnie was a very bad person and she abused Heather. One of the phrases Roger used was, she needs to go away and never come back. All this new information led to a search of Roger's property. The police found a spent 9mm shell casing, a matching projectile and matching bone fragments. Roger was found guilty. He will receive his sentencing on April 23, 2020. It could be between 20 to 60 years in prison. Because he used a weapon, he could even face life in prison. Adam Brandich was a 26-year-old father of two from Quakertown. He had recently inherited a lot of money when his father passed away. With the money, he bought a house. He lived there with his roommate, Damon Smoot. Adam met Damon only a few months before buying the house. In October 2004, Adam's ex-girlfriend and the mother of his children got worried when he stopped answering her calls and he was reported missing. One of the strange things was that Adam's roommate Damon was still living in Adam's house all alone and was driving Adam's 1997 Mercury Cougar, which was his most prized possession. Damon told Adam's mother that Adam gave everything to him. Each time the police or someone asked Damon what happened to Adam, he would tell a different story. He said Adam went to Iowa because he was behind with child support. Then he said that Adam went to Wisconsin to flee an arrest warrant. 
The story would change a couple more times after that. Only this year in 2020 did Damon decide he will tell police what happened. On January 9th he agreed to plead guilty and he told police everything. He told them how he was jealous of Adam and all the possessions he had. On October 4, 2004, Adam called Damon asking him for supplies, he needed to fix something in the house. Damon told Adam to meet him at his workplace. There, the two of them got into a massive argument. Damon retrieved a baseball bat from his car and hit Adam over the head with it. Adam fell to the ground and started having a seizure. Damon then placed his fingers over the nose and mouth of Adam until he stopped breathing. Damon showed police where he had buried Adam. It took more than a day to retrieve the remains. Police are sure that if Damon didn't tell them that they were never going to find Adam. Damon was already serving a 10 year sentence for an unrelated crime. He will be eligible for parole when he's 62 years old. Adam's mother Donna Brandich says she knew all along that it was Damon because he was driving Adam's car and living in his house like he owned it, basically living Adam's life. District Attorney Matthew Weintraub had this to say, Adam never had a funeral, never had a grave marker, just a tomb in the rock for 15 years, but I'm pleased to now say he's been returned to his family for a proper burial. James Essel was a loving father and husband living in Montgomery County, Virginia Beach. He owned the Sugar Loaf Mountain Market convenience store. In March 1992, James's body was found laying behind the counter. He was stabbed 29 times. It was clear that he had fought hard for his life since the suspect's blood was also found at a crime scene. This was the only lead police had, but DNA was not as advanced as it is nowadays and they couldn't do much with it. In 2017, police sent the DNA samples they had collected to Parabon Nanolabs. Parabon Nanolabs was able to make two images, one of how the suspect might have looked like in 1992 and what he might look like in 2017. This unfortunately did not help and police decided to focus on genetic genealogy to solve this case. They used databases to find family members of the suspect and narrowed it down. In January 2020, they narrowed it down to Hans Hewitt's. On February 10th, police collected a DNA sample of Hewitt's and it matched the blood they found perfectly. Two days later, they went to arrest him at his house. They found him in his car. He had a gun with him and he waved at the police. When he was told to drop it and he didn't, he was fatally shot. A neighbor of his caught it all on tape. Hans's wife believes her husband is innocent and is now working to clear a deceased husband's name. On the evening of 20 September 2002, the residents of the Hampton Woods apartment complex in Gwinnett County, Georgia, awoke to the sound of someone using a firearm. One of these residents was a woman playing outside with her son when they heard a loud pop. In the parking lot of the complex, a man was just fatally shot in the back of the neck. When the police arrived at the scene, it was already too late. He was quickly identified as 30-year-old Weldon Mills. The Gwinnett County Police Department immediately started the investigation. They questioned some of the residents in the complex, his family and his friends. Anyone with information were asked to come forward, but no one did. The police believe what happened may have been related to a dispute over illegal substances. There were no suspect and no real leads. The case soon went cold. In 2019, the police decided to look again 
advocates weld in mills. Maybe something was missed the first time around, or perhaps someone who didn't want to say something at first would speak up now. The police questioned a lot of people that weren't questioned initially. They traveled to many states to interview anyone they believed could know something. And it turns out someone did know something. Thanks to these interviews, the police developed enough probable cause to charge 43-year-old Titus Norwood. It was hard to find Titus at first. The police described it as a transient lifestyle. In March 2020, he was found in Lacey, Washington and arrested. He will now be extradited to Gwinnett County to face the charges against him. Gwinnett County's Assistant Police Chief J.D. McClure had this to say. The arrest in the case illustrates the successful partnership between a Gwinnett County Police Cold Case Unit and the District Attorney's Office. We will continue to devote our time and our resources towards solving cold cases. Additionally, we hope that this arrest brings some degree of closure to the family of Mr. Mills. On the evening of June 10, 1978, Fernando Calero's body was found outside a business on East Alini Street in Phoenix, Arizona. He along with a woman was found in a bed of a truck. The woman was assaulted, but she survived. Fernando was badly beaten and succumbed to his injuries. Fernando was just 23 years old. The investigation started immediately and the Phoenix Police Department used everything they had available to them to try and find the person who did this. They were able to retrieve some fingerprints from the crime scene. The fingerprints were matched to 21-year-old Glenn Edward Williams. Glenn worked and lived in the area. He was taken into custody in January of 1979. Glenn denied any involvement or wrongdoing. The police on the other hand believed that they had enough evidence to charge him with the crimes. However, they had to let him go and the charges were dropped since they didn't have enough evidence. This was unfortunately the only lead they had. Without anything else to go on, the case went cold. In 2019, the Phoenix Police Department decided to take another look at the case of Fernando. They knew that DNA technology has come a long way since 1978 and believed they could perhaps get a case solved now. More items were tested. The test that came back allowed scientists to link Lane Williams to the crime. Police interviewed him again in April of 2020. Unsurprisingly, Glenn still denied any involvement. Based on the evidence gathered in 1978 and the new DNA evidence, police arrested and charged Williams in connection to the cold case. The Phoenix Police Department now sees this case as being solved. Their crime lab administrator Jody Wolf had this to say. 42 years ago, those detectives did a great job obtaining and packaging and maintaining the evidence. The scientists were able to use the evidence tested with today's technology and it identified Williams as a suspect in his brutal attack. 42 years ago, this was the scene of a homicide. 21-year-old Fernando Calleros and a woman were found in the bed of a pickup truck. Calleros had been beaten to death. Detectives began working the scene and gathering evidence. The charges were dropped because it, the case was turned down due to a lack of evidence. So we work really closely with our cold case colleagues um, in the department, both in homicide and sexual assault, and we're constantly looking for ways to use current technologies and new um, approaches to being able to combine best science with best evidence. When we talk about our crime lab, it's important to point out the men and women who work there truly are scientists. 42 years ago, those detectives did a great job of obtaining evidence and packaging it and maintaining it. It's been in the custody of the Phoenix Police Department for 42 years. We have an amazing team. They are incredible professionals, incredible scientists, and that's what we love is science. It's a huge reward and a huge experience for our analysts to be able to participate in these, pro in these cases. John Anthony Muncy was born December 7, 1967 in Columbus, Ohio. He liked to go by the name Tony. 
he was a huge fan of ACDC and KISS. 15-year-old Tony was last seen in the evening hours on October 15, 1983 at the York Plaza movie theater. His parents weren't expecting him home soon, but after some time, they got worried and called the police. The next day, his body was accidentally found by a police officer who saw a leg sticking out of a trash can. He was found in South Kalina Road, Delaware County, Ohio. He was quickly identified as Tony. It was believed that he passed in Columbus and was then taken to be dumped in Delaware County. Tony was stabbed numerous times in his back. It was noted that there were blood at a crime scene that didn't belong to Tony. The police had nothing else to go on. They stored all the DNA evidence they had, but could do nothing with it at the time. In 2013, the case was reopened. They believed that the technology was now there to solve his case. They sent in all the DNA evidence they had. Unfortunately, when the test came back, there was not a match. They had the DNA evidence, but just didn't know to who it belonged. In 2018, one of the officers heard about a cold case that was solved in Washington, where the police had a DNA evidence, just didn't know who it belonged to. He did some research into the case and found that they contacted Parabon Nano Labs to help solve the case. Officer Rusty Yates then contacted Parabon Nano Labs himself and asked if they would help, and they agreed. After initial tests were done, Parabon Nano Labs said they narrowed the suspect down to a family with three brothers. Two of them were quickly ruled out. This only left a man by the name of Daniel Allen Anderson. Anderson had a very extensive criminal history involving teenage boys. This information helped police determine that Anderson was responsible for what happened to Tony. They couldn't question him since he passed away in 2013. They are however certain he is responsible and considers the case solved. Tony's younger brother had this to say. He'll never go to jail for this crime. But the biggest thing is we all know he'll never hurt another person again. There are two families that were hurt in this and I hope this is something they can find some closure on themselves as well. Olaf Baum was born in January 1927 in Stockholm, Sweden. Olaf was an intelligent young boy and he soon learned German and English. In 1945, he joined the army and served for a couple of years. He also visited a lot of other countries. It was during these visits that he started to form strong political opinions. Olaf identified as a socialist democrat. Olaf became prime minister of Sweden in 1982. He made a lot of enemies because he was very outspoken and his views were far on the left. On 28 February 1986, he and his wife, Lisbeth Baum, was walking home from the cinema in Stockholm. Olaf was then shot in the back from close range. A second shot grazed Lisbeth's back. Medics were quick on the scene to take him to Sabbatsburg Hospital. But it was too late. Lisbeth survived the ordeal, but Olaf did not. The street was busy, so one would think someone saw who did it, but it was not the case. No real suspect came forward after talking to the witnesses. During the next few years, there were a few possible suspects had the police looked into, but none of them could be connected to the case. In 1989, a man named Christer Peterson was convicted for the crime after Lisbeth Palm identified him as the man who took the life of her husband in a police lineup. An appeals court later overturned the conviction and they had to let him free again. Then on June 10, 2020, Swedish prosecutors stated publicly that they knew who ended the life of Olaf Palm. They named him as Stig Engström, also known as Scandia Man. Engström was one of about 20 people who had claimed to witness Olaf getting shot. He worked as a graphic designer for Scandia Insurance Company, located near the crime scene. In the initial investigation, Engström told investigators that he actually tried to resuscitate Olaf. During the most recent investigation, 
it was found had he lied however. It does not necessarily mean anything, but it was noted that Engstrom had very different political views than Olaf. He was later identified as a possible suspect by Swedish writers Lars Larsson and Thomas Peterson. Engstrom took his own life back in 2000, so it is not really known why Swedish prosecutors now feel so confident it was him. Nevertheless, they have closed the case and consider it to be solved. It took 34 years, 10,000 interviews and 134 confessions before this case was solved. A lot of people are not happy about a conclusion that the Swedish prosecutors made. They do not believe there is enough evidence to be certain Engstrom is guilty. The investigators made a lot of mistakes during the investigation and the fact that it took 34 years for them to solve such a highly publicized case might have influenced their decision. In a lot of cases where the media and the public presses the investigators to solve a case, mistakes are made. With Engstrom not being alive anymore, we might never truly know what happened. As for now, the case is being seen as solved however. Susan Eads was a 20 year old woman from Texas. She aspired to be a model. At the time, in 1983, she worked as a waitress. Susan worked at a prickly pear bar and also worked part time for a place called Charlie's Bar. In August 1983, she cut off work early and went to a place called Jason's Club where she was last seen. At one point during the evening, an unknown man asked her to dance, but she declined. The last time she was seen was when she left the club. The next day, her body was found in an empty lot on NASA Road 1 in Seabrook, Texas. The police determined that she was choked by the bodysuit she wore the previous evening. Her 1976 Chevrolet Monte Carlo was found in a parking lot of the Gulf State Yachts Boat Store very near to where her body was found. Her clear leg high school class ring she was seen wearing the previous evening and a gold necklace was nowhere to be seen. The police started their investigation by taking DNA samples they found on her jumpsuit. They also talked to people that saw her at Jason's club. The people told police about the unknown man who had asked Susan to dance with him. Seabrook police created this composite sketch of the mysterious man. They were not sure if this man was involved, but they did not really have other leads to follow up on. Then out of nowhere, a strange man started calling Susan's mother. Most of the times, he would just call and not say anything. Later on, he did start to speak. She got police to record the calls. The man claimed that he had pictures of Susan. He even offered to show them to her mother. He claimed his name was Bill and he lived in Houston on Telephone Road. This man always hung up before police could trace the call. He also never followed through with his plans to show the photos. A language expert were used to see if he could find anything of interest. The language expert could determine that his accent is southern but that did not really narrow it down at all. It is not known if this man was actually involved or if he was just someone had read about the case in a local newspaper. After this, the police had nothing else to go on and the case soon went cold. In 2017, investigators looked into the case once more. They came across a man by the name of Anthony Shore. He lived in the area where Susan was found back in 1983. In 2017, when investigators took a closer look, he was in prison. Anthony had a long list of victims whose lives he took in a similar fashion to how Susan lost her life. Using the DNA samples they retrieved back in 1983, Anthony was ruled out however. Investigators were not able to match the DNA to anyone on their database. It did give the investigators an idea though they decided to contact the FBI and genealogists. 
the next few months were spent comparing the DNA sample to online ancestry profiles. Finally, a match came back to a distant relative of the suspect. The relative was a young child at the time of the crime. The relative was very helpful, and after some more testing, the investigators believed they had their man, Arthur Ray Davis. He was the 35-year-old Vietnam veteran and local boat captain. Davis matched the composite sketch almost perfectly. Both had a cowboy hat, hair that falls over the ears, a mustache that hangs past the sides of the lips, high cheekbones and a pronounced chin. They could not speak of Davis though, since he passed away in a car crash. Interestingly enough, the car crash happened just four months after he took Susan's life, and it happened less than a mile from where she was found. Just solving this case is not enough for investigators. They want to know why Davis did what he did. They are asking anyone with information to come forward and contact them. Texas Ranger Brandon Bess said that somebody out there knows him. Somebody out there knows who he was and what he was about, especially at that time in August of 1983. The family of Susan Eats and the investigators gathered to place roses on her grave after the case was recently solved. The family accepts that the case is solved, even though there was no trial or conviction. They are happy they know who did it. Of course, they would also want to know why he did what he did. A woman was walking her kids to school on the morning of October 24, 1996. She saw the body of a young woman with long blonde hair. The young woman was lying on the ground in an alley. This happened in Aurora, Colorado. The police was quickly on the scene. They noted that a young woman had been stabbed. A local newspaper were asked to publicize the case so that more information could come out. Witnesses then came forward and helped identify the woman as 25-year-old Tanji Sims. Tanji grew up in Tennessee but relocated to Colorado. She worked at a restaurant as a cook. The police could also determine that the last time she was seen, she was walking toward a semi-trailer. Whoever did this to her left behind a lot of DNA evidence because he accidentally cut himself. After a lengthy investigation, the police still had no idea who did this to her, and the case went cold. In 2019, the case was looked into again. The investigators had learned about advances in DNA testing and genealogical research. The DNA evidence was handed over to Joan Hanlon of United Data Connect. This led investigators to the family of the suspect. The investigators had to travel from state to state in search of family members. After some more testing in 2020, they finally knew who did it. Wesley Backman, who was born in 1955. The only problem was that he passed away in 2008. The investigators learned that Wesley had been a truck driver, and for some time he lived in the same area as Tanji Sims. And as you would remember, Tanji was last seen walking toward a semi-trailer. It took 23 years for this case to get solved. The detectives are now looking into the possibility that Wesley Backman had other victims as well. Sean Marie Neal was born on the 2nd of August 1972 in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. On June 1st, 1996, 23 year old Sean was supposed to meet a man by the name of Don Gibson in North Myrtle Beach. When she did not return home, her boyfriend reported her missing. Not long after, the police conducted a welfare check at a condominium in North Middle Beach. Inside, they found Sean Marie Neal's body. She had been choked. Several items from the crime scene was located in a nearby dumpster. The investigators were able to collect a lot of DNA evidence from these items. This was unfortunately all they could do and the case went cold. Then in 2017, the case was looked into again. Physical evidence from the case were sent to the Richland County Sheriff's Department Forensic Lab 
in Columbia, South Carolina. The lab was able to uncover DNA evidence that was missed in the initial investigation. The new DNA was entered into a national DNA database in 2020 and matched the DNA of Ronald Lee Moore. It was revealed that Ronald had also been named a suspect in a series of burglaries and assault cases. Ronald lived in Maryland. The investigators learned, however, that he had friends in Louisiana. They believe he passed through Middle Beach and crossed paths with Sean Marie Neal. He passed away in 2008 while in prison for an unrelated charge. It took 23 years for this case to be solved. It is quite a coincidence that in the first two cases of this video, the person who committed the crimes passed away in 2008 and both cases took 23 years to be solved. Carolyn Cox Rose was a prominent Pensacola real estate agent in 1978. Carolyn was the vice president of the Better Homes Incorporated. On the morning of April 7, 1978, just after 8 a.m., she left her office. She told her assistant that she had an appointment with a potential buyer at a $65,000 house. By 2 p.m., Carolyn still hadn't returned and her co-workers got worried. So they drove to the house to see if anything was wrong. They discovered her 1977 Chevrolet Caprice Classic parked outside the house. When they went inside the house, they made another discovery. In one of the bedrooms was Carolyn's body. She had been choked. It shocked the whole community. All of the other estate agents realized how easily it could have been one of them. Local real estate agents quickly banded together to offer a $5,000 reward for any information that might lead to an arrest. The investigators were not sure if the crime happened on the spur of the moment or if it had been premeditated. They had no idea who the client was that Carolyn took to the house. All they had was DNA evidence they collected from the crime scene. Back in the late 1970s, there was very little they could do with the DNA. This meant that a case sadly went cold. Some good did come from the crime, however. A local inventor, Dylan Vickery, began converting electronic garage door openers into devices designed especially for real estate agents in danger that could blare loud sirens at a push of a button. The Scambia County Sheriff's Office launched an investigation into a man from New York. The man had been in the greater Pensacola area looking to buy at the time Carolyn's life was taken. There was, however, not enough evidence to make an arrest, and the man was cleared as a suspect. Then recently, an investigator by the name of Kevin Coxwell asked the Florida Department of Law Enforcement and Parabon Nano Labs to help solve the case. Thanks to advances in DNA technology, the DNA evidence they collected back in 1978 could now be used. It was matched to Julius William Hill Jr. This was announced in June 2020. He passed away in 2007 while in federal prison for an unrelated crime. It took 42 years for this case to be solved. Carolyn's family members just wish this news could have come a bit earlier. Her son, who was 24 years old when she lost her life, had to be sedated when he heard the news. He passed away this year from the virus, just a few months before learning who took his mom's life. Vanessa Smallwood was a 46-year-old woman from Burlington County, New Jersey. Vanessa worked for a contractor at Philadelphia International Airport, but she was out on disability. She had three adult sons and struggled with mental health issues. On January 27, 2014, Vanessa and her husband went to a dry cleaning business on Haddonfield Road in Cherry Hill. Her husband went into the dry cleaners while she waited inside their car. The car is a 2005 Chrysler minivan. When her husband came outside, there was no sign of his wife or the car. Later that day, there was a ping from Vanessa's cell phone 
on Broad Street in Clayton, Gloucester. The police did not suspect any foul play and believed she ran away. There was no activity on her credit or debit cards. In 2020, divers with Walker diving underwater construction were doing an inspection in the Salem River to check for obstructions in the water that would interfere with shipping when they discovered a vehicle. The vehicle was a Chrysler. Inside the car, the divers noted there was a female body. DNA testing was done and was confirmed that the body belonged to Vanessa Smallwood. It is not known how Vanessa ended up in the water. Her family can now at least give her a proper burial. Esther Lucille Westenbarger lived in Fostoria, Ohio for most of her life. She attended Fostoria High School and worked for Findlay Industries, an automobile parts manufacturer, for nearly 20 years. In 2009, Esther accepted a buyout from her employer and decided to move to Kokomo, Indiana to be closer to her mom and siblings. Initially, she went to live with her mom, but after falling out, 51-year-old Esther used the money she got from the buyout to get her own place. One evening, she went out with new friends of hers to go bar hopping. She parked her Cadillac outside a bar. Esther was last seen walking on foot, presumably to go get her car. That was the last time she or her car was seen. After Esther missed a surprise party, she planned for her mom. The family got worried and she was reported missing on November 13, 2009. The new friends of hers were all questioned, but no new information came to light. There was a man who raised suspicion. He lived close to Esther and was in and out of prison frequently. There was, however, nothing linking him to her disappearance and he was let go. The police was not only looking for Esther, but also her car. She drove a Cadillac with a customized Ohio license plate reading M.S. Esther. Sadly, the police could not find her or her car and the case went cold. Then, on June 17, 2020, Howard County 911 Dispatch Center received a call regarding a car that was found in a pond. A dive team was then used to retrieve the car. They noted that it was a Cadillac and that a female body was inside. When they saw the license plate, they already knew it was Esther. Nevertheless, DNA testing was done and it was confirmed that it was Esther Lucille Westenbarger. The leading theory is that because she had too much to drink, she accidentally drove into the pond. The police have said that foul play is not suspected. Her daughter, Matilda Rood, had this to say. For me, the past 10 years have been miserable. I can't answer it any other way. We go on with everyday life, but you never stop thinking about her and wondering. It's the questions, the why, what, how and when. The questions constantly keep running through your head. Well, I now know the where and how. And so hopefully, that'll help me finish this process of healing. A young woman's body was found in a field in Dixie, Georgia in 1981. She was strangled. The police tried to identify her, but they could not. She then became known as the Brooks County Jane Doe. Her remains were displayed in a local funeral home in the hope that someone could identify her, but sadly no one did. Not long after, a man by the name of George Newsom came to the Brooks County Police Department's attention. He worked at a traveling fair. Inside the motorhome he owned, the police found the rope that had been used to strangle the woman. George Newsom escaped custody from the Brooks County Jail and went on a run until January 1983 when he was arrested in Alabama. After he was arrested again, he confessed to the crime and he pleaded guilty at the trial. He was sentenced to life in prison. In 1988, he passed away without ever revealing the identity of the victim. 
Then, exactly 37 years after the woman's body was found, a post about her was put on Facebook. A woman by the name of Kayla Bishop saw the post and told investigators her childhood friend known to her as Cheryl Hammock had gone missing in 1981 after traveling with a fair. She saw the sketch of the Brooks County Jane Doe and felt it looked similar to her friend Cheryl Hammock. Investigators then contacted Hammock's surviving family members. DNA was taken from her biological mom. It was then confirmed in 2020 that a Brooks County Jane Doe is indeed Cheryl Hammock. The identification has brought a degree of closure to Hammock's family. They also knew why George Newsom did what he did. When he confessed to the police, he told them that he employed Cheryl at a traveling fair. They had an argument and he decided to take her life. Karen Lee Spencer was a 12-year-old girl from Virginia. She was last seen alive on November 29, 1972. Karen told her family members as she was going to a friend's house to borrow a book. When she did not return home, she was reported missing. When a couple days later her body was found in the woods, in an area known as Fiverr's Field. The site is now the Huntington Metro Station. Back in 1972, lots of neighborhood kids would gather there. Karen passed away due to massive blows to her upper body. The Fairfax Police Department looked into 16-year-old James Jimmy Edwards. Some of Karen's friends told police that they believe James was her boyfriend and that if someone knew anything, it would be him. The police questioned him, but he denied having any involvement. No links connecting him to the crime could be established and he was let go. He passed away on August 23, 1997. There was not much else to go on and the case went cold. It would remain that way until 2018. Two acquaintances of James Jimmy Edwards told investigators that in the 1990s James told them that he took the life of a girl when he was a teenager and he buried her in a field. Over the following 18 months, investigators received more information that incriminated Edwards. In 2020, they were finally able to conclude that James Jimmy Edwards indeed took the life of Karen Lee Spencer. In a police statement, it was said, for nearly five decades, major crimes detectives remained steadfast in their pursuit of justice for 12-year-old Karen Lee Spencer and her family. The fact that we never gave up combined for our community's willingness to come forward with information were critical in solving this case. Pamela Marr was a 16-year-old girl from Woodridge in DuPage County. She attended Downers Grove South High School. Pamela was last seen alive just after 9 p.m. on January 13, 1976. She left her friend's home to go buy a soft drink at McDonald's. The next morning, her body was discovered by road workers. She was found near College Road and Maple Avenue in an area called Lyle. It was clear that Pamela had been assaulted and strangled. Investigators were able to collect DNA, but that was all they were able to do, and the case went cold. Then in 2001, a DNA profile could be created. When it was entered into the CODIS database, there were no match. Then in 2019, with the help of Parabon Nanolabs, a more sophisticated DNA profile could be done. A detailed description of the suspect could be created. The investigators then created a genealogical family tree based on the results. Finally, it was determined that the DNA matched Bruce Lindahl. The odds of the DNA matching someone else was 1 in 1.8 quadrillion. Investigators traveled to Texas to inform Pamela's brother and father that the case is now solved. Bruce Lindahl passed away at the age of 28 in 1981 after he stabbed the victim because he accidentally stabbed himself. 
talk about karma. The police are now looking into other possible victims and lost their lives at the hands of Bruce Lindahl. On 10 October 1987, a passerby discovered a woman's body on a hillside near Estrella del Mar Road in San Diego. She had been assaulted and strangled. The police identified her as 26-year-old Julia Hernandez Santiago. The investigators collected several key pieces of evidence at the time, but they were unable to identify any suspects and the case went cold. Then, in June 2020, police announced that they arrested a man in connection with Julia's life being taken. The police said 54-year-old James Charles Kingery emerged as a suspect after he was arrested in March for unrelated charges. When he was arrested, he had to supply a DNA sample. Then in May, the crime lab notified the police had James' DNA matched DNA taken from Julia's body. The investigators then followed new leads, cross-checked all the information until they were certain that James Charles Kingery is responsible. On June 15, 1984, 15-year-old Risa Drexler visited her grandparents' house in North Carolina. Risa's grandfather went out to the grocery store and his wife went to the hairdresser. When they returned home, they made a startling discovery. The body of Risa Trexler was found in the spare bedroom. She had been assaulted. The investigators were able to collect DNA from the crime scene that belonged to the suspect. Back in 1984, there was not much they could do with the DNA, but they stored it so it could be used later. The police believed it was a family member at first. Her friends and family were questioned, but no real information came to light. Then one of the hairs that were found at the crime scene was tested, and it turned out that the hair belonged to an African-American man. Many witnesses also came forward, claiming they saw an African-American man running away from the crime scene. Sadly, the case went cold and would remain that way for many years. In 2018, Risa's sister appeared on Dr. Phil. This renewed interest in the case. Investigators took another look at the case. Since DNA advanced a lot since 1984, they decided to enter the DNA they collected back then into a public genetic database with the help of Parabon Nanolabs. This helped investigators narrow it down to family members of the suspect. A body of an unknown man was then exhumed for more DNA testing. The police refused to reveal the identity of this man. We do know, however, that a man was in his 40s at the time of the crime, that he is an African American. Had he passed away in 2007, he has a violent past and worked near the crime scene. After more DNA testing, it was confirmed that a man's DNA matched the DNA found at the crime scene. With the man not being alive anymore, the police and the family realizes not all their questions will be answered, but they see the case as being solved. Margaret Peggy Beck was born in 1947 in Colorado. Since the age of nine, Margaret was a Girl Scout. In the summer of 1963, 16-year-old Margaret was a camp counselor at a Girl Scout camp. On August 18, 1963, Margaret failed to appear for breakfast. Her tent mate then went to check on her when she found Margaret's body inside their tent. She had been assaulted and strangled. The reason the tent mate was not with her was because she felt ill and slept elsewhere. Her family was informed about what happened to her later that day. The police launched an extensive investigation to try and find out who could have possibly done this. Without any leads, however, the case went cold. 
In 2007, they created a DNA profile from the DNA collected at a crime scene back in 1963. It was then entered into the CODIS database. Unfortunately, no matches could be made. Then in 2019, with more advanced DNA technology, they tried again. This time, they used United Data Collect. It led them to family members of the suspect. After some more investigation, the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office announced in April 2020 that they believe James Raymond Taylor ended the life of Margaret. They issued a warrant for his arrest but have been unable to locate him. He was last seen in Las Vegas, Nevada in 1976. Taylor had been living in Edgewater, Colorado in 1961 and was married. He worked in a television repair shop and had at least one child. The police believes he was still in the area in 1963 at the time Margaret lost her life. Taylor would be 81 years old today if he is still alive. It is believed that this is the oldest cold case solved using genetic genealogy. But with more and more cases being solved thanks to DNA, it might not be the oldest for long. Her three sisters are alive and this is a painful time for them uh, to have this this wound reopened um, and, and, uh, and, and, and we acknowledge that. And our sympathies um, on behalf of the entire Sheriff's Office go out to them. On the 19th of October in the year 2000, a man's body was found in a room at the Dollar Inn. The motel is located in Indianapolis. The man had been strangled and assaulted. Police were quick to identify him as 38-year-old Arthur McFall. Investigators found the suspect's DNA under Arthur's fingernails. They entered the DNA evidence into their database but found no match. The police had nothing else to go on and the case went cold. Then in July of 2019, the Indianapolis Police Department's cold case unit received word that a match had finally been made. A 54-year-old man by the name of William Swain was arrested in Gosham County for theft. When he gave his fingerprints and was entered into the CODIS database, they learned that it matched the fingerprints on the telephone in Arthur McFall's motel room. DNA tests were then done and it was confirmed that William's DNA matched the DNA found on Arthur McFall's body. The police arrested William Swain in March of 2020. William told investigators he did not know Arthur McFall and he was not in Indianapolis. After some more investigation, the police discovered that William was however in Indianapolis at the time Arthur's life was taken. After hearing the news Arthur McFall's son Dwan McFall and his mother were relieved, but they still had questions. I'm going to wait until I talk to my grandmother again, who's always said she would never give up on finding out what happened to my dad. We have so many questions, including why did he have to do that to my dad? Scott Johnson was an American PhD student in mathematics. In 1984, he married his partner, Michael Noon. The two of them met while studying at Cambridge University in the UK. Then in 1986, the two of them moved to Australia. On December 8, 1988, Scott spoke to a friend who called him on his home phone in Sydney. This is the last time anyone is known to have spoken to him. Then two days later, on December 10, a fisherman, Brian Butson, sees a man's clothes about 10 meters back from the edge of the cliffs North Head at Manly in North Sydney. Then a man's body is discovered at the bottom of the cliffs. He was identified as 27-year-old Scott Johnson. The injuries he had was consistent with a fall from a cliff. Detective Doreen Krushank concluded that Scott had jumped voluntarily. The family did not agree with this conclusion, especially Scott's brother Steve. He tried again and again throughout the years to get the police to reinvestigate. Steve argued that there were a lot of gay hate crimes taking place in the area 
and that Scott had a lot to live for. The police on the other hand felt that there were no way to prove whether Scott jumped or if he was pushed. The biggest reason the police refused to look into the case again however was because Scott had previously told his partner that he wanted to jump off the Golden Gate Bridge. Finally, on December 10, 2018, the police decided to look into the case once more. By this time, they felt that Scott was pushed and no longer believed that he jumped voluntarily. Over the years, they saw how many gay hate crimes there were in the area and that others have been pushed off the cliff. On December 9, 2018, the New South Wales Police announced a $1 million reward for any information that leads to an arrest or conviction of Scott Johnson's attackers. Then, on May 12, 2020, the police finally arrested a man in connection with what happened back in 1988, 49-year-old Scott White. The police looked into Scott White after a witness came forward. After some more investigation, the police felt they had enough evidence that Scott White is responsible for what happened to Scott Johnson. In 1965, five-year-old Jerry Barnett was left with a babysitter by his mom, Anna Marie Barnett, in Kentucky. Anna Marie was just a teenager, and she struggled to take care of Jerry. While she worked, family members would usually look after him, but they were all busy. That is why she had to get a babysitter, someone she didn't know at all. When Anna Marie returned home, there was no sign of her son Jerry or the babysitter. Little did she know, the babysitter took Jerry with her to Delaware. In Delaware, the babysitter abandoned him. The state then became responsible for Jerry. They had no idea who he was or where his family was. He was given the last name Thomas, assigned an approximate birth date and placed into the foster care system. Anna Marie got little help in finding her missing son. She believed it is because she was a teen mom and because she is black. During the years, Jerry married and had children of his own. His son, Damon Parker, found a story interesting of how his dad didn't know his real family. The son then went for a DNA test from a genealogy website in 2016 and learned that family in Kentucky. His DNA was matched to a cousin of his by the name of Will Barnett. After some help, he learned that his dad is a son of Anna Marie Barnett. Finally, this year, after 55 years, Anna Marie and Jerry Barnett reunited in Radcliffe, Kentucky. Outside the house, Jerry was met by a lot of family members he did not even know he had. Anna Marie's overjoyed having her son in her life again. She knew it was him the moment she saw him. They are now making up for lost time. Anita Pitot was born on March 9, 1942, in Augusta, Maine. In 1967, she moved to Southern California to make it into Hollywood. Every day, her parents received letters written by Anita. When the letters stopped, her family got worried and hired a private investigator. But he was unable to find her. Little did they know that Anita had passed away on March 14, 1968. This was just five days after her 26th birthday. Her body was found in a field in California by three young boys. She had been assaulted. It was believed that her body was transported to the field. The police had no idea who she was or who ended her life. She was buried in an unmarked grave. A composite sketch was made hoping that someone would identify her, but no one did. There were no leads and the case went cold for many years. Colleen Fitzpatrick from the DNA Doe project was asked 
to help track down a victim's family members using DNA. Within a week, she found a family member living in Maine. This relative then told the story of how her cousin Anita Pitot hasn't been seen in years. After more DNA testing, it was confirmed that the unidentified woman was indeed Anita Pitot. The DNA Doe project was not done there. They used DNA found on her clothing and matched it to Johnny Crisco. He passed away in 2015 at the age of 71. Not an awful lot is known about him, other than he was in the army and was arrested in Orange County back in 1971. He was arrested in 1971 because he assaulted a woman. He was just 17 years old back then. Thereafter, Johnny joined the army as a paratrooper. He was discharged, however, for having anger issues. He was 28 years old when a crime was committed. He was never on a police radar until his DNA was found on her clothing. The police believe Anita accepted the ride from him and he then took her life and dumped her body in the field. Anita's parents passed away, but she still has surviving family members who now finally have some closure. All these years they believed that Anita had shunned them, but that was not the case after all. A memorial service was held for her in July 2020. On October 27, 1985, a man and his son were walking on a plot of land. They were looking for a place to build a house on in Parker County, Texas. While walking, they came across human remains in the field. The remains had been dug up by animals. Investigators believed that a shallow grave the remains were found in was dug just a year earlier. They followed up on numerous tips and missing persons to try and find out who the person was. The Tarrant County Medical Examiner's Lab took a look at the remains and believed it belonged to a male between 14 and 20 years old. They were also sure it belonged to a white male with predominantly European ancestors. In 2018, Parabon Nanolabs were asked to help identify him. They took the DNA from the investigators and were able to predict the hair color and some facial features. This is the picture they came up with and believed this is what a man looked like. It was shared around but no one came forward had recognized him. In 2019, with more DNA testing, Parabon Nanolabs located family members of the man. It was a struggle to find the correct family members because someone in the family was adopted. Finally, they believed that they knew who the parents were of the man. They then went to the University of North Texas to do DNA tests on the parents. After more testing, they were able to confirm that a man is 22-year-old Billy Feigner. His parents told investigators how Billy went to work in California back in 1985 and they never heard from him again. This led investigators to California because they wanted to know what happened to Billy. There they learned that Billy worked with another man by the name of Forrest Ethington. A pair of them would steal coins. At one point, Billy decided to go solo, but he was caught. Forrest was worried that Billy would rat him out and he decided to take the life of Billy. A surprising amount of people knew about this and that is how investigators learned about all of this. In 2020, when police felt that they had enough evidence to charge Forrest Ethington with taking Billy's life, they also learned that Forrest passed away just a month earlier due to a heart attack in a prison. The investigators are still unclear as to why Forrest and Billy was in Texas and not California. But other than that, they believe the case is solved after so many years. This is the only picture of Billy, since all the other photos of him were destroyed during Hurricane Katrina. I am exceedingly proud 
of our investigators and the agencies which assisted us in solving this case. Several law enforcement agencies joined resources to close this case and bring the family some sort of closure regarding their son. Melissa Lee was a 15-year-old girl from Bothell, Washington. She was abducted between 9.30 p.m. and midnight on April 13, 1993 from her home. The next day on the 14th, her body was found in a ravine in Everett, Washington. It was clear that she had been strangled and assaulted. It was, however, not clear to the police if Melissa knew the suspect or what led to her losing her life. In an address book belonging to Melissa, the police found the name Michael on one of the pages along with his number. He was interviewed several times. The police learned that his name was Alan E. Dean and that he was 35 years old. The police found it interesting that he went by a different name. They also learned that 35-year-old Alan was dating 15-year-old Melissa. Another bit of incriminating evidence against Alan was that he was accused of assaulting a minor in Arizona. The police felt confident that he was responsible for what happened to Melissa, but they did not have enough evidence against him. They pursued several leads and interviewed dozens of people, but unfortunately, the case went cold. Then, in 2020, the Snohomish County Sheriff's Office decided to ask Parabon Nanolabs, a genealogy company, for help. Parabon Nanolabs performed a genetic genealogy analysis on evidence found at the crime scene. One of these items was a discarded cigarette butt. This led them to several of the suspect's family members. Finally, Washington State Patrol Crime Lab could confirm that the DNA at the crime scene matched the DNA of now 62-year-old Alan E. Dean. In July 2020, he was arrested without incident at his home. Adam Fortney, a Snohomish County Sheriff, had this to say. The arrest yesterday shows how our detective's determination, combined with new advancements in DNA technology, continues to get us one step closer to justice for victims and their families, even decades later. Investigators said the case is still under investigation and they asked that if anyone had information about Dean's activities around 1993 to come forward. Investigators said the suspect used a fake name of Mike or Michael. Alan E. Dean remains in the Snohomish County Jail with bail set at $2 million. Melissa's mother, Sharon Lee, said, I'm just happy to have lived long enough to see this happen. I hope he rots in hell. Melissa's mother feels she finally has answers. I'm just happy I got to live long enough to see this happen. I can't do it. Yeah, whatever you want to do, it's totally fine. I hope he rots in hell. <laughs> 